So much of that is just comes from practicing rhythm guitar and pra literally strengthening my ability to just play rhythm guitar and subdivide the beat any way I possibly want. Right. And next thing you know, you start doing that in your soul. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? When you, when you learn to play an E funk rhythm, an E9 chord like James Brown, and are able to go, whatever, and subdivided mm -hmm. 8 million ways, next thing you know, that's going to seep into your soloing and you're going to phrase things in a different way. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Jazz Rocks with Adam. Today is my special guest and is one of my favorite players out there today, none other than Josh Smith. Josh, thank you so much for agreeing to come on to the Jazz Rocks and do this interview. Happy to be here, man. Sure, thanks for having me. Josh has toured with Taylor Hicks, Ricky Fonte, and Grammy winner Raphael Sadiq. So, okay, before we continue with the in in introduction, I gotta ask you, did you ever get a chance to play My Ex-Girlfriend is a Ho with Raphael? <laughs> uh, we actually did play play that in, in uh, rehearsal a few times, but never never at a gig. Ah, oh, bummer. I would, I'd be like, if I had that gig, I would like, hope that we could do that song. Josh was born in Connecticut, but grew up in Florida and now calls L.A. home. He has either opened up or shared the stage with B.B. King, Joe Bonamassa, Eric Johnson, Andy Timmons, and Kirk Fletcher. That's uh, quite a handful of guitarists there. <laughs> well, <laughs> it seems like all my friends are guitar players. I don't know how right. that happened. Right? <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. We really got to talk about B.B. at some point. Um, because everyone out there knows there's the four kings, right? B.B. <laughs> King, Albert King, Freddie King, and Burger King. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the music world, at least anywhere. Depending on how I'm feeling, I, I, one of them is always at the top of the list. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, he just came off the road a few weeks ago doing some of his own gigs while opening up for Joe Bonamassa. There's nothing like road chops. How much of your road chops have you retained? Oh, well, it was an interesting uh, trip the last... I've been mostly gone for like 10 weeks straight. And my chops fluctuated because I wasn't actually opening for Joe. Oh, I okay. I was playing in his band. Oh, so okay. I was mostly playing rhythm on that. So what happened was I played a month with Joe. Then I went to the UK and did two and a half weeks of my own tour. So then I'm soloing a ton on that. Then I came back and did another month with Joe, where I don't really, you know, I get one or two solos a night when I'm backing him up. This was new, too. I'd never done that with him before, going on the road with him playing, you know, Sideman. Right. And um, so I don't know. My road chops kind of fluctuated. And then I had played literally 50-something gigs in a span of 10 weeks, which after the last two years was a ton and a shock to the system to get back to that amount of gigging and playing. Right. So then I got home and I've been home a couple weeks now. And until I played at the baked potato on Tuesday, a couple days ago, I hadn't touched a guitar for weeks, which never happens. Like mm -hmm. I never go more than a day two max. So that was weird playing at the baked potato the other night. It took me a good, like six songs to feel my hands feel normal again. Cause I never take days off like that. Right. At, at least, like, it's so weird during COVID. I'm, I don't really play that much. I mean, I've been teaching a lot. So I do have my, my hands on the instrument that way. But it's not the same as doing gigs or, or practicing. Um, but I do do a series of, like, exercises just to try to keep my, especially my left hand in shape, like, while I'm watching Netflix or something like that. Yeah. I think we both started performing at the same age. I joined the Musician Union when I was 12. Yeah. and started doing paid gigs then can you yeah. talk about your early years yeah that's the same age i started really playing gigs with uh you know with adults and other guys i i had started playing when i was six years old and i progressed pretty quickly because i was super into it and willing to put in time to you know 
get better. And, I, you know, I was just obsessed, like we, a lot of us get, with guitar. Right. So I wanted to just guitar, guitar, guitar all the time. So by the time I was 12... I had some frustration start to set in because I couldn't find any friends or like-minded kids who were into it like I was, uh, at least with that amount of seriousness and effort. And then Fervor. even if they were kind <laughs> of into it and could play, they definitely weren't into the music that I was into. Because at that time, it was tail end of heavy metal and kind of getting into grunge and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm listening to Albert King and... Coltrane and you know right Ray Charles so it was like uh I knew I needed to find a way to start playing gigs because I knew that was important to my growth and and pro progression as a musician so the natural thing was I better start trying to find some adults to play with you know where I can go improvise and find a find somewhere to get better so mm -hmm. that started with blues jams and stuff like that and very quickly at some of those blues jams some of these adults would ask me to come play gigs with them, you know, paid gigs. And that's kind of how it happened. It snowballed very quickly. And next thing I knew, I was playing a lot of gigs. Cool. Yeah, with me, I it was just three neighborhood kids, including myself. Uh, so I'd be uh, two other kids. Just started to get together to jam. And uh, the dad of one of them kind of came went out of re retirement from doing some gigs and he saw us playing and I think he was scratching his head and going hmm this might be like a cool thing to do is to get some kids backing me up <laughs> so that's so he had us enroll in the uh, musicians union and then we started doing gigs right right from there. That's cool I, I, and I I uh, I think I made as much on a gig then as I still do now <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the funny thing. It's like a, a seventy five dollar gig is still a seventy five dollar gig. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I remember, just because I lived far, a little far enough away from town that I couldn't just go to the bank. I had to wait for my parents to drive me to the bank. So I would have like stacks of bills in my drawer at home until I could get to the bank. <laughs> I have I had I felt like I had more money then than I do now. Oh, yeah. No, I saved mine up in an envelope until I had enough to buy a guitar. Yeah, Every same time. here. Yeah, same started. here. I didn't buy a guitar. Or, or no, I, I, I lied. I bought a guitar and an amp. I did buy something. Yeah. It sounds like, like I, I think it was a, either something I read or listened to that uh, it sounds like the universe sent you a really great teacher as your first teacher when you're a kid. Did he teach you anything about jazz? Because wasn't he like a graduate from Miami? Yeah university yeah he was a, a um graduate and um he did teach me a little bit about jazz uh he just got me really going on the path the problem was then he he moved away because he wanted to be a jazzer so he moved to new york you know because back then that was still the thing to do right was uh, go to new york and try to make it but yeah he was my first teacher and um you know, he would tell my parents little things here and there. He would be surprised about how quickly I would pick something up. And I remember him being really, really excited about my time as a kid. And I didn't get it back then. But he used to always say, man, you you have better time than me. You're of time like the, you know, like a veteran, you know, like an adult. Uh -huh. And I'm like, I don't, I, I didn't, I don't know that I knew what he was talking about. But um, when he left, the next teacher I found was more of a blues guy. And he was like a seasoned weekend war you know a guy who played gigs his whole life playing blues mm -hmm. you know wasn't amazing but he was a pro kind of a professional so he he taught me a lot about uh starting to, to kind of improvise and being able to, to the difference between like a solo that says something and a solo that is just whatever you know and right that was important i, I was with him for a few years and then after him i got with this guy tom strider tommy lee strider who was a shredder, you know, Van Halen type guy, but he had his fundamentals on lock, like his theory mm -hmm. and fundamentals. So he he really laid into me with, with with theory and foundational stuff. And but by I mean, quite honestly, it it all happened so fast. It seems like it was like, you know, a year or two with the first guy, and then three years with the next guy, and a couple years with the next guy. Next thing I knew, I was playing gigs. Right. I didn't have as much time to go to the lessons, anyways. You know. Yeah. Now, I, kind of the same thing happened to me. I, I was actually still taking lessons for a couple of years while I was gigging. Yeah. But then 
when I was 14, I remember the music school called me up and was like, so you want to start lessons again after like a summer break, right? And I'm like, no, I think I'm good. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. uh, I mean, by the time I was nine or 10, I started like lifting stuff off of my dad's record collection. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that I started off playing instrumentals first, like, you know, ventures and stuff like that, and Chet Atkins okay. stuff. But uh, um, what or who are your top three influences? Actually, that made more sense when I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know it's a hard, hard thing to answer, I know. Yeah, I mean, B.B. King is like the initial spark for sure. Like, I remember my dad putting a B.B. King record on and, you know, hearing that slow blues intro to something like Sweet Sixteen or something and just wanting to be able to do that. I remember that very vividly. Um, I was really into Hendrix for a long time, uh, but, but Stevie, when I found Stevie Ray, that changed the game for me big time especially when I finally saw a video of, of him playing as opposed to listening to the record. I saw this video, someone gave me a bootleg and, you know, cause this is well pre YouTube and all that. Right. And I was just, just floored by Stevie and the intensity. He's sweating like crazy and playing so hard and seemed like every note was like a live or die for him. And right. I remember right. that making a big impression. Like I, I want to do that. And, um, and then, you know, it's an amalgamation, I guess, of all these other guys. Danny Gatton was another big pivotal moment for me because finding Danny Gatton, and to some degree guys like Robin Ford and Larry Carlton, but really Danny Gatton was, was the eye-opener in that, hey, it's okay to like all these styles, try to learn as much as you can, try to become as good a player as you can, and... It's not like, you know, I, up until that moment, I thought of everything in black and white. Each style was like its own thing, and you could mix and match and do this and that. And then I heard Danny Gatton, and it was like, you could play whatever the fuck you want, whenever the hell you want, anytime, you know? Right, I, yeah. That was important for me. Yeah, I was in a Danny Gatton phase there for a while, back yeah. in the, the 90s as well. I think uh, I'm a little bit older than you. Uh -huh. When were you born? 79 I'm 79 42. oh yeah so i'm like 12 years older than you because i i started gigging in 1979 oh okay yeah. um but yeah so you're that perfect age that you know stevie ray vaughn would have been a big thing for anybody learning guitar yeah i mean he was so i was 10 when he passed away so i was a little young too i didn't get to see him i actually had a chance but i didn't know it i blame my dad for not forcing me to go he said hey do you want to go see Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jeff Beck with me uh, at the Miami Arena. I was nine years old. I said, no, I don't want to go. You know, uh, he should have just dragged me there. And I tell right. him that all the time. Um, but after he passed away, you know, by the time I was like 11, 12, I, I got more into it. And then, like I said, someone handed me a video. And that was a major mm. game changer. Yeah. Yeah, I thought maybe the video would have been at uh, in Toronto at the... Um... No, that's yeah. it. El Macombo or whatever. That's but. the video. Oh, that is? Okay. El Macombo. That's the one. Yeah, it was before it was official release, but it was that video, 100%. And it's I, like a, it's like almost like a stadium rock concert in a small venue. It's mind-blowing, and yeah. they were so on that night. He was so oh, on. Yeah. The band was so on. In fact, now that I I know those guys pretty well, especially Chris Layton and, well, Reese wasn't there, but Reese and Tommy, I've asked them, hey, did you guys know – how good you played that night when you did it, you know? And they were like, yeah, we knew. <laughs> so when I heard that the video had been found and they were going to, they were like, we knew it was going to be great. Cause we, we were, I remembered it as a great night. Chris Lane right. told him. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I mean, um, I can't remember. I don't think I've ever played at the Elma combo. I haven't uh, either. It, it, uh, it was going to get shut down, but I think someone stepped in and finally saved it. Cause I used yeah, to live in Toronto. I think someone just put a bunch of money into it, if I remember correctly. And there's like a new st a studio attached to it and stuff like that. Oh, I didn't even know about that. But because uh, I used to live in Toronto for 20 years. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I, I just remember the last time I was in Toronto, it was like they were advertising the last gig before it closes down kind of thing. And that was probably, I don't know, 2014 maybe. 
let's talk a little, just a little bit about gear. I don't want to talk a whole lot about gear, but um, what's sure. your absolute favorite go-to guitar and amp? Well, these days it's this new signature model uh -huh. Ibanez, which I worked really hard on. It's called the the Flat Five, and um, you know I had played the same black Chapin Telecaster that my friend Bill Chapin built me for about 15 years, and that was my number one. And when Ibanez approached me about doing a signature guitar, they quickly won me over by telling me basically I can do whatever I want uh, within reason. And they trusted me to, you know, basically design from scratch and choose every piece of the guitar and every, every you know, detail down to the last degree. And so it was kind of a, uh, you know, a no-brainer situation to get involved with them. Also, I spoke to many friends who had been with Ibanez for years. And that was the, another recurring theme was, oh, my God, you've been with Ibanez forever. They <laughs> must be a good company to deal with. Right, and I found that out very quickly. So, uh, right now, this is the thing I'm most excited about in the world is this guitar. Uh, I've been playing it full time for a year now since it was announced, and just now finally it's hitting stores because of all the shipping delays and stuff. It got stuck in containers mm -hmm. and all that, but it's it is, it is showing up in stores now. So that is okay. uh, my main guitar, and my main amp here in the studio and for recording and stuff is my Morgan. JS12, which is a Josh Smith signature amp. It's kind of a version of his PR12, which is like a Princeton reverb with a 12-inch speaker, a two-knob reverb circuit, and a boost. Uh, it also comes with my my signature speaker in it from Eminence. Um, I use that amp every day, every session, every little thing I do. Mm -hmm. and then I have bigger versions of them that I travel with and play at gigs. Right. But that's the smaller one is the one that gets used every day in the studio. Nice. Uh, have you ever heard of Port City amps? I have, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's my my sort of touring rig. It's, it's uh, nice. It's it's it doesn't have any overdrive. It's just a, like a clean platform. Yeah, yeah. But for for me being a jazz guy, I actually have quite a bit of pedals for a jazz guy. But oh yeah. But um, and like no to get organ sounds because I like my favorite thing is a trio. So yeah. I just want to get fill out you know some more sound sure. just in that trio format yeah and uh it that amp works perfectly for that but i also like for around town not that i've been really gigging that much the last couple of years but uh i just use a, a pv classic 30. oh yeah sounds, man, those are underrated amps oh i know that sounds great it has a, a really nice juicy thick uh clean tone on it too mm-hmm like even though it's got the EL eighty fours in it, it does not sound like like a AC thirty yeah. or something like that, you know. Yeah, uh, those have always those original Tweed PV classics and stuff were always underrated amps to me. Yeah, I've got I got the older ones, the one in made in US, not the ones made in China. I go, I just bought it used a few years ago. Nice. And then speaking of guitars, let me show you mine. This is my sort of non-jazz guitar. I'm, nice. I'm, a, I'm a big Telly guy, too. This is um, a custom shop Telly. And I can't remember the name of it, but it's basically Spanish for uh, tone horse. Tone horse. Yeah. I so whatever. Spanish, so otherwise, I would translate it, but I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> me, me neither. I'm Canadian. I don't <laughs> I, I don't even know. I'm supposed to know how to speak French, but I, but I, I don't. <laughs> Um, and it, it just fits like a glove. It's kind of got like, um, like a, a soft U, I guess, like a fifties, but not the V shape, uh -huh. maybe like late fifties. Yeah, I, I like, like the Gretsch pick up in the neck. I always like that on a tone. They blend together really nicely. As long yeah. as you keep the, uh, keep it down and not get it too close to the strings. They blend really nice. Yeah. if you can see it the one hanging behind me that's my my sort of jazz guitar it's a seven oh, yeah, string oh really with the but it's like set up like lenny bro with a high a not yeah, not yeah, the yeah. low string nice and uh that thing just sounds so good <laughs> so thick especially when i put a uh lawler pickup in the in the neck position nice it just it just you ever the see whole, lenny bro 
I never seen him. No, but I knew lots of people that knew him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that that's kind of what how I play. I play with a thumb pick and, and finger style, mostly. I never got to see him either, but, I mean, obviously I've listened a ton. And right. A lot of people I know have a lot of stories about him. In some ways, <laughs> it, it, it's, you know, not that they were the same player, but here yeah. in L.A., everybody's got their Ted Green stories about – going over and hanging with Ted Green, taking a lesson and working on mm -hmm. them. And it's like so many of my friends from where you're at have their Lenny Bro stories. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I, he, I was a little bit too young at, to, to get to know him because he would have died, you know, like when I was probably in grade 9 or something, grade 10. Right. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't into jazz at the time. It wasn't until I moved to Toronto to go to college to um, – is when I sort of got the bitten by the jazz bug, so to speak. Gotcha. Um, as for solid body guitars, um, I believe Leo got it right the first time with the, with what we now know as the Telecaster. It wasn't called that at first, but oh yes, especially the old style machine heads. I I like those ones where you drop it in from the, the top, the best, and that's my Tele's Ibanez got that is too. The only Ibanez that has those kind of tuners. Noise. <laughs> yeah, I dig that. I'll have to keep my eye out for in, in New York here to see if, if uh Oh yeah, they're starting pops to show up. up. I'll try yeah. it out. Um so what is it about the telly style that, that you like? Pro I'm I can guess that it's probably the same thing that I like it for, is it's pretty much the most versatile guitar there is. It's is oh yeah. I think without question it's the most versatile guitar because of its simplicity it's a blank canvas right um also it's all about the sum of its parts it's it's missing certain things it's not as comfortable as other guitars and that's part of the reason that it's so explosive and versatile it's just like open and right. raw and you know yeah, you got compromises all over the place on this guitar. You, know, you got three saddles for six guitars. You got two pickups instead of three compared to a Strat. You got no contours. You know, it's sharp against your arm. All of those things. Right. And yet somehow it just, I've never played any other guitar that lets me be me more. Like what I'm thinking and what I want to sound like shines through without any, like, you know, barriers in the way. Whereas every other guitar kind of automatically makes me think of different things, makes me play different things. Have I have associations built on all of them. And even just the way they feel make me play differently. This makes me feel just like me. There's no thinking involved. And you're right. Like, it's, it's unbelievable to think, you know, yeah, this is an Ibanez made in Japan in 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you boil this down to, the, you know, the bullet points, it's practically unchanged from the guitar Leo made in 1951. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, the, when he finally made a two pickup version of the Esquire. It's like, it's unreal how well he got it right the first time. Yeah, I, so we're in the same camp that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nice, nice. Um, yeah, because I know you started off on a Strat, I believe, right? Yep. yep. So, so every time I you pick up wrong. a Strat, <laughs> every, every, pick, every time you pick up a Strat, I bet you you play a little bit differently. Oh, without question. And yeah. now it's more of a thing where I want that. When I pick up a Strat, mm -hmm. it makes me do differently and play differently. And I like that for certain moments and for certain things. But, you know, as a kid, it was obviously partially influenced by my love of Stevie and all the other guys who played Strats. I mean, the Strat yeah. is an iconic guitar. And, you know, there's nothing that sounds like a Strat on the neck pickup. That's such a special tone. Right. Um, right. But... Yeah, once I found the right telly, everything just sort of clicked into place. And it was like I I hadn't realized I'd been searching for that my mm -hmm. whole life until I found it, you know? Cool. Yeah, I mean, I guess you can like, liken it to when an actor puts on their wardrobe for a certain part, like they kind of get into character. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like You can sort of liken it to that, maybe. Yeah, it more felt like once I picked up the right telly as opposed to like getting into character it's almost like it just took away all the other barrier like right then i was just playing 
mm-hmm. me. It, it just was like there was no thought. I was just all of a sudden I was me. You know? That that's how I feel about my seven string. Nice. And I I I designed that guitar and I had someone build it for me. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's it's exactly the way I right. envision it. So every time I put it on, it's it's just feels like it's you're putting on a a well worn glove, you know. Yeah. And and the fact that you got a guitar, I mean, that's like every kid's dream is to get a guitar endorsement from uh, and get your own model. I mean, that's crazy. Congrats, yeah, on, congrats on that, by the way. It's thank you. It is crazy. A store here in L.A. got a bunch of them the other day. Fine, they had ordered a bunch, and a lot of them were pre-ordered already, but some mm-hmm. are still there. So I went down to to sign them all, and I walked in, and yeah, there's. 10 of my guitar you know and i was like wow this is unbelievable like the little kid in me would be freaking out right now i was right cause i was freaking out like this is cool you know like mm-hmm. yeah obviously i'm a you know i love fender i love gibson i love them all but i mean ibanez is also a legacy brand that's been around my whole life you know and mm-hmm. so many of my heroes and friends have been with ibanez forever so the fact that yeah anybody can now walk into guitar center hopefully and pick up a guitar that I designed, you know, and that has <laughs> yeah. my name on it, is unbelievable to me. Unreal. I, I doubt that a, a seven-string guitar with a high A is going to be that popular, though. <laughs> <laughs> with your average folk. You're probably right on that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, Josh, you've got a great YouTube channel um, as well. I started watching your channel kind of early on. Well, not early on, but um, but when you started putting some time into it, I think yeah. maybe you were like 1,200 subscribers or something, or between was, 1,200 yeah. and 1,400 or 1,500, something like, like that. Yeah. And um, I think it was the interviews. Like, I really like your interviews. That's what that's what YouTube sent me to your your channel at first. Nice. And I I I I think it was probably Oz Noy. Maybe was like okay. was he one of the first people that you? It was one of the first. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I. I know Oz here in New York a little bit. Um, we, I got a chance to play with him at a guitar workshop that we, that uh, I was teaching at, and and he was the the sort of guest artist that came in for my nice. class. And you also, not that long ago, interviewed another friend of mine that lives in Brooklyn, Yodam Savan. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, matter of fact, yeah. I lived with Yodam for a little bit. Um, oh really? Yeah, just it was like maybe three weeks or something like that. Um, his girlfriend at the time, I w- I moved in with her, and he ac- actually helped me get the place. Nice. And I I was just going through a divorce, and I had to move out, and I had to find a, a place quick. So he helped me out that way, and um, and then he was living there because he was in between places to live or whatever. So you know, we got a chance to jam and stuff a little bit. But I've known Rodham for. Jeez, I don't know how long now. Probably at least since 2014, 2013. He's a very nice guy, man, and what a great yeah. player. Yeah, uh, same with Oz, too. Just to- Yeah, I've known Oz now. I'm mean, Jeez, it, it's, you know, it's probably like 15 years or something like that. Oz is such a nice guy um, and not a monster, obviously. Yeah. The interviews have been really fun because other than just a handful of them, they were all my friends already. I knew everybody right. I'm interviewing. So it was cool to kind of, from another perspective, get their story, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and, and just hear the way people come up. I'm, it's really interesting to me to hear everybody's story and how where they came from, what were the pivotal moments for them that kind of led them to where they are now as a player. And, yeah, that's been fun. And it's been cool that people uh, have enjoyed watching them. Uh, I've slacked off here a little bit in the last few months, but only because I've been super busy. So I'll get back to uh, interviewing and posting videos soon. I have a few in the can. I'll right. get back to posting again soon. Yeah, my, uh, I mean, my channel it more re- revolves around like jazz lessons. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, every once in a while I'll do an interview. And the last couple of months I just haven't been able to put out as many videos as I would have liked because of just yeah. other life stuff that's been getting in the way. No, but, yeah. uh but I, so I hear you. <laughs> I know, I know. You what know, you're I mean, talking. that's been, YouTube is an interesting thing. Cause it's like mm-hmm. at the beginning of the pandemic, I got all fired up 
mostly because I needed something to keep myself busy. You know same I mean? here, and, same here, yeah. So it worked as far as that goes. It kept me busy. And I also do feel like it, it, it you know, maybe put my name in front of some people who didn't know who I was, you know, introduced me to an, some new audience. Yep. Uh, so that was cool. And I felt like I made some cool content. The interviews are really good. I think I made some good videos about some of my heroes and other lessons about other things, just the mm -hmm. way that I think about things. And the response was good. But then, yeah, once like work started to come back, it was like, man, it's really difficult to keep up. Like I was posting at one time two or three videos a week every week. Yeah. And yeah. that became impossible to, to continue to keep doing. And um, so now I'm kind of just treating it like, I, I I'll just post when I can post and when I have stuff I want to post. I'm not stressing it because I was stressing about it for a while. Like I've got to make these videos on this schedule and do this and that. Um, but I don't want that to be you know I don't want to be a full time YouTuber. I just want to produce the content I want to produce and when I have a chance to do it, I'll do it and put it out and hopefully people enjoy it and that's it. No, know? that's a, that's a good healthy attitude. Yeah. Um. I but I was the same as you. I would put out two to three videos a week yeah. and i was i came up with these blues jam tracks and stuff and and yeah. uh, just anything i could think of because like when you're when your channel is new you're trying to f mm -hmm. still find your sort of way to oh yeah what to come up with but uh, now that you've got it grown to like i think almost uh 36k 30 something like that honestly i don't even know <laughs> i i looked at it early i can't remember if it was 36k or or 37k but uh i mean you got a nice number there now it's not like you're trying to grow it from this beginning stages so yeah it's weird because you know i talked to some of my friends who have much 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 bigger channels and it's taken over their lives like they've become less of a full-time guitar player or, or mm -hmm. musician and more of a full-time youtuber which is cool if that's yeah. what you want to do it i, I see it it could be your full-time job mm -hmm. and i don't know that i want that you know what i mean right. so i'm just gonna do it at my own pace well, if I could do it enough, when I get if I get it worked up to the point where I don't have to really teach during the day, yeah. Oh man, that will that that'll be awesome. Taking up your your time for money is just it's it's not the thing that I want to do. I know. Yeah. I know. When you interview people, you you kind of I think almost always ask this question is like what would you rather have if you couldn't have if you could only have one thing a great guitar to do a gig or a great amp yeah I and i know that. i know your answer but maybe you can share that with uh my viewers yeah so i i ask every i i have a list of 10 questions but that's one of them uh so we always have a chat and then i ask ask everyone the same 10 but when i ask them that question would you rather have a, a great amp and a shitty guitar or vice versa a right. great guitar and a terrible amp I would always take the amp over the guitar because I can have my guitar and be forced to play into some terrible, much worse gig experience for me than vice versa. If I have to play somebody else's guitar, but at least I have like my amp and some pedals and I know I can get a tone out of it, that's a better experience for me personally. But I understand it's different for everybody, it's probably different for you because you rely on your instrument you right. know, and the, the way that it's set up and all of that so you wouldn't even be able to do your gig no you know, it's like not like i can Joseph go to us a... yeah you know there's no way he can play his gig on a strat you know what i mean it's like right. not possible so <laughs> I, I get it yeah no it, it's kind of the same situation i guess as him because i can't walk into a store and just pick up the, another thing that that's even close to mine you know yeah exactly so uh yeah i would i would pick the guitar first because mm -hmm. my guitar sounds so good i don't know what it is about it but it just sounds so good that i think i could get at least some kind of a passable sound out of an amp if i had to you know of course you always want a, a great amp but but you know like i've got some pedals that you can maybe shape your tone a little bit with uh, especially this one i've got over the summer it's just a a 53 dollar uh clone like a, a clon clone and there's something about that that just adds the right amount of mid-range without sounding like a tube screamer yeah. and shelves off just a little bit of the lower frequencies that i really like and it just kind of just presents your 
sound like it's not really processed, but just like here, it's a little bit nicer now. <laughs> I wow. really dig it. Yeah, I don't really use it that much for any gain sounds or anything. Just kind of a clean, almost right. like a like an EQ. Gotcha. So that would probably you know help. The one thing I really like about your playing, Josh, is uh, how your lines flow. And you got great ideas. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about your playing psychology, for lack of a better a term. What what are you thinking about or not thinking about while you're playing? Um, it's it's kind of both of those things at the same time. I well, like, yeah, I, I I mean everybody's probably a little bit different, but I kind of know what you're talking about. I'm trying to to think about certain things while also not thinking about anything you know it's weird it's like um i know i want i i'm a blues guy at heart so i want everything to feel a certain way and most importantly i want it to be honest as far as uh an improvisation goes i want it to be from my heart from my head you know and a mix of those two things like what i'm really hearing at that moment and feeling at that moment but also, of course, I have to be thinking about the form of the song and what's coming up in the form of the song. Right. Um, and then reacting to the other outside factors, which is what's the band doing? What's going on in the room even? What's my tone making me do? What's right. all of those things are kind of part of it. Um, you know, it's weird. You know, you understand this as an improviser. You kind of hit, hit upon... The formula like that works for you and what you what you need to be kind of thinking of in the moment right and you you work on all these things you strengthen like all of these tools until then it everything else just kind of takes care of itself once you've strengthened all those tools you mm -hmm. know which doesn't most, happen overnight <laughs> no no i mean i mean yeah. well look you you know you've been playing your whole i mean i've been playing i'm 42 i've been playing 36 years mm -hmm. and professionally for you know 30 years so it's like it's a lot of music and a lot especially a lot of soloing i've soloed every day of my life for 30 years you know lots and lots of times every song every night and so i've built up an ability to kind of you know create narrative on the spot right <clears throat> excuse me yeah never mind the uh, 10,000 hours rule <laughs> it's i'm sure it's probably more than that Probably. Give me uh, one second. Yeah, no worries. Sorry about that. Yeah, All right. No worries. Um, Sorry. Yeah, no worries, man. Um, I, who knows? I may have to take a, a washroom break. You never know. I've done that before in interviews where like, excuse me while I take a break. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, to, to boil it down, I guess mostly I... I try not to think about anything and mostly pay attention to what I'm hearing and feeling. And then if I am thinking about anything, it's only about the form of the song and, and what's coming up next, you know? Right. And it, I liken it to be, being more aware of stuff rather than thinking too much about it. Yeah. It's like yeah. walking down the, the sidewalk. You're, you're aware of what's going on around you maybe that your legs are moving, but you're not telling your legs to move. You know, no, and then and you, you know, you're aware enough that you stop at at the at the corner so that a bus doesn't hit you or something, you know, it's, yeah. it's like that. But you don't or when you get in a car, you're sometimes you drive home and you, you're like, holy shit, I don't even remember the trip home. Yeah, it's, it just becomes a, like a more automatic thing that I think people first starting off don't understand that how much how many hours it takes to get to that point where of practice. And and, yeah, I mean, and it's not a just practice either. I mean, it's playing gigs. It's too. gigs. It's gigs. And, yeah. and unfortunately, that's something that a lot of generation younger than us don't have quite as much. Op I was fortunate to not only was I playing so many gigs from, you know, 12 years old on most of those gigs. Mm -hmm. Honestly, almost all of them. I was probably the only soloist. So I was soloing all night long. You know, on every song, you know, the yeah. guy would stop singing and go, go, it's your solo. <laughs> so I had to quickly learn how to carry a night full of soloing all night long, you know, two sets. And it's like, you know, that is invaluable. 
that amount of just on the job training and it's hard to get that these days it does i went through exactly the same thing uh there was uh he played usually acoustic guitar just rhythm and then exactly the same thing as you said like just okay go <laughs> so you yeah. just you're figuring it out as you go along you know yeah you and, learn quickly oh the audience responded when i played this type of thing you know versus that right. or hey i already played this six times <laughs> you know what i mean let yeah. me play something else it's like you start to learn all the mm -hmm. tools and, and things that you need to be successful as a soloist over you know a lifetime and it, like you said my line you, you know you like my lines or whatever my my phrases a lot of times when i when i do teach lessons a lot of the questions will be along those lines would be like man you play some really long phrases sometimes that cross a lot of bars and you know are these things you've worked out and i'm like no of course not i haven't worked out any of these phrases you and i mean obviously you understand this but it would sound like, very much very differently if you did have stuff worked out i'm sure <laughs> exactly yeah. it's just the muscle memory mm -hmm. and the, the the experience that allows me to play long phrases that sound like something you recognize you know because I, i've built up that ability to do that yeah and i when i first started i just when I would listen to, like, we never had any rehearsals <laughs> for this band. It was just learn on the bandstand. Nice. Learn how the song goes, you know. Uh, and then when I listened to records, in my young, na naive mind, I thought that everybody improvised a solo. Like, what, whatever went down on record, I thought, holy shit, did they improvise that stuff? You, that means every night I've got to come up with something like, that good or better every time so <laughs> that in a weird way helped me develop as a player 100%. i think yep. um yeah i and i hear you playing the changes more than just your average blues player too sure yeah you know i mean and that then, that just comes from you know i you know i don't consider myself a, a jazz guitar player at all but i just love jazz and i i just love music so mm -hmm. i'm always pushing myself to kind of better myself as a musician, but mostly just better my ability to play what I'm hearing. So that's what drives me the most. When I hear something, I'm normally disciplined enough to stop myself and go, I should figure that out. Like, what am I hearing here? Because I consider that a problem or a barrier. Mm. You know, when I'm hearing stuff and I can't play it and I don't know what it is. To um, me, that's what ultimate technique is. Just be able to get out what you're hearing in your head out to your hands. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm always, that's, that's like, quite honestly, that's the tool that I'm always working on the most. Is the strengthening brain. that, <laughs> that bond. Yeah. You know? yeah. Cool. The hand, yeah. hand brain connection. Yeah. And it's funny, like you said, road chops and stuff like that. Yeah. There's times, you know, like in the middle of a tour, man, when you hit that six gigs in mode where that, that bond is so strong, that you play, you could play anything you, you're thinking of, you know, and uh, those, I live for those moments. Yeah, there's something different about being on the road because you don't get to play during the day like you would even at home. You, you just have to put all that energy in on the gig and the rest of the time you're sitting in the vehicle on to the next gig or in your hotel room or something. Yep. Yeah, I guess, well, this this kind of part of the uh, last thing that we just talked about is I, I really like the natural way that, you know, you can, you sort of wear your influences on your sleeve, but not in a, like, oh, I'm going to play a, a jazz like now. Oh, I'm going to play a country thing now. And I'm sure that comes a lot from Danny Gatton in a big way. Because yeah. my first gigs was playing country. So that kind of stuff pops up into my playing, it, it, even on a jazz gig, maybe to maybe some people's chagrin. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, it just, it's there. I can't help it. You know, and bluegrass. That's what I first started playing, bluegrass in the country. So, Yeah, a lot of that comes from Danny, but also Robin Ford was important in knowing that, like Robin was another one that when I heard him, it let me know it was okay to, hey, man, this guy knows a lot of guitar and music yeah. and, you know, can play, play the changes and he knows what he's doing, right. yet he still sounds like a blues guitar player. Mm -hmm. And you could tell he loves the blues. And he's done his homework on the blues and respects it. And that was important to me, like, because up until that time, 
it was like, oh, you can't, I'm not going to play this jazz thing in the blues. That's like, like I was cheating on the blues, you know what <laughs> right. I mean? Or, or something like that. You're not authentic was, enough or something. Right. And right. those guys were important to let me know, like, hey, you can still be playing the blues for real, you know, or doing this for real and to play these other things. Music is just music. And so, you know, I just, yeah, I try to just play, like I said, what I'm hearing and what I'm feeling. So sometimes that may be a more jazzy thing in a non-jazz context, right. or it may be some sort of country thing in a certainly non-country context, because I don't often play any country music per se, you know, but uh, it's just, yeah, it's, I just want the ability to, to tell my my story i guess and mm -hmm. all those things are part of my toolbox you know and hopefully if it sounds right in your head it'll sound right when it comes up <laughs> yeah you got to trust that you yeah. know what you're doing you know yeah. what i mean and yeah yeah are there is there any style of music or a musician that has influenced you that people might be surprised to hear about um yeah yeah i mean might be surprised uh let's i mean there's there's some you know i'm not a big like you know shred guy but eddie was a big influence on me i don't know if that'd be a surprise to anybody right but but his rhythm playing was a big influence on me monster uh, he swung really hard man mm -hmm. and his rhythm playing and his right hand was fucking amazing um and then vocals would be the biggest thing like I, a lot of my phrasing comes from just literally the sheer amount of listening I've done to Ray Charles, Sam Cooke, Marvin Gaye. Like those are honestly my favorite things in the world. Like if I could sing like Sam Cooke or Bobby Bland or, or Ray Charles, you know, I, I'd give right. up guitar in a heartbeat. So <laughs> I, I, I've listened so much to those guys that their singing inflections have worked their way into my phrasing to some degree, mm -hmm. uh, both knowingly and unknowingly, you know, because I just listen so much and, and, uh, that would, you know, not that it's surprising that I listen to those things, but how much of an influence it is on my, my soloing. I think, yeah, I think maybe people don't realize that. Yeah. Cause that like, um, how do I, how do I put this? I think both of us would agree. Cause I've seen you talk about this before. Not only singing but singing is a, a big part of it because you're you're phrasing like you would sing but it's the rhythm of how you do it too yeah like i've done several videos where i, I stress how especially in jazz but any music really where rhythm is so important and and i'm like you like i hear this but in my head all like all the time like i'm always tapping or something yeah you know 24 hours a day it yeah. never goes away but the sing, you know when you sing something like that i find that the biggest difference between something i sing and something i play isn't normally melodic you know it's not the note choice it's the rhythm right of the way that i'm doing it so you know a lot of the main reason that i'll trade with myself and sing a line play a line is because i'll sing something rhythmically that i would just never play that way mm -hmm. and so then you find it and it's something cool um and that's the same thing from listening to the way ray charles phrases a line or something it's not the notes i know those notes you know what yeah. i mean it, it's it, it's the way he says it you know? yeah after a certain point the notes are the easy part it's it's getting yeah. the, the the right phrasing and the rhythm down because i i say if you fix your rhythm it, you'll fix your phrasing yeah well people i mean people ask too about the ability to you know play those long phrases and mm -hmm. cross bar lines and stuff like that so much of that is just comes from practicing rhythm guitar and pra literally strengthening my ability to just play rhythm guitar and subdivide the beat any way i possibly want right. and next thing you know you start doing that in your soloing you know mm -hmm. what i mean when you when you learn to play an E funk rhythm, an E nine chord like James Brown, and are able to go whatever and subdivided eight million ways, next thing you know, that's gonna seep into your soloing and you're gonna phrase things in a different way. Yeah, because then you're thinking more like a horn section. 
and or like a percussionist if it's like a funky part that's a lot of things that that uh, I think a lot of people these days are missing out on they everybody wants to shred and 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 it seems like nobody knows how to play rhythm anymore I think Robin Ford talks about that too he's like he's has a hard time finding people that that can play rhythm guitar you know? well I, th I think enough guys don't look at it with the right mindset it's like you know I love playing rhythm guitar and it's just as much of an improvisation as soloing exactly like I yeah. love coming up with the part and changing on the fly and playing something that lifts up whatever's happening whether it's somebody singing or another soloist or even just something that locks in so specially with the rhythm section exactly something like that's a it's just as fun as soloing yeah you know? uh-huh i totally agree i totally agree yeah uh now mostly in a jazz context i'm comping for myself okay yeah. in, in a trio right kind of thing yeah. but at any time like i used to do some swing gigs or something that you're you're kind of mostly doing like a freddie green and that's kind of cool too just yeah but it's all like you said there's, you can still improvise anything that you're doing <laughs> you don't have to stick to one boring thing oh my god listen to, just yeah. listen to robin ford comp on a blues behind somebody else or yeah. just when he's singing he's unbelievable at you know creating a part that is continuously evolving and moving but yet still feels constant and never mm -hmm. jarring you know what i mean right. it's a part of the rhythm section and yet somehow he keeps kind of changing it <laughs> and raising up the intensity and and you know it's a you know you yeah. know who else is really good for that is mike stern oh yeah that yeah. raising that intensity like he I've, I've seen him play a couple times in toronto with mike brecker uh-huh and i swear to god like stern stole the show eat every time every every solo it would just start off here and the next thing you know he would, he'd bring it to here and you're like oh he can't pr possibly go any further than that and then he's like another level then the next level yeah it's it's just make it keeps you on the edge of your seat you know but that again that's like doing lots of gigs yeah and I, i'm yeah. sure maybe playing for miles for both of those guys had something to do with that too yeah i mean i'm sure you know, you know again it's it's just all the experience you know yep. there's no let's face it mm -hmm. there's just no substitution for real world experience practical application yep end of sentence done next <laughs> right it's like uh there i just gave you the answers to music there you go um sort of i mean it's just, you know it's, if you want to be a good golfer you just have to fucking golf a yeah. lot yeah <laughs> I mean, like, yeah yeah yeah, and it, and it, and it's not even just golf, but it's also like working on all the little other things too to refine everything. Now let's let's talk about BB. I know that he had a, a big impact on you, likely uh, from what you were saying. Uh -huh. How did you get to know BB, and can you talk a little bit about how you got a chance to open up for him and how yeah. well you knew him and any any cool stories or something that you might have. Yeah, I have some cool stories. Uh, you know, before I even got to meet him, he was just such a big hero because, well, let's face it, he was the king of the blues. There's just, there's no, you don't need to sugarcoat it. That's what mm -hmm. he was. So, you know, I was obsessed. My dad had a lot of his records, and I just clearly remember things like Live at the Regal and Blues is King and, and having these records come on and just being, I didn't understand how something could make me feel it so deeply when he would sing and play you know when he would sing a line so wonderfully and then follow it with the perfect fill i was i would feel it as a kid and it was that was amazing to me um so then once i started gigging and and, and you know becoming a working musician i started to, to get a following in florida um so then when when blues you know national blues acts would come down i'd often have the chance to open up because i i could add some ticket sales maybe or people started to know who i was and so one of the promoters who was responsible for bring, bringing bb to florida basically every year you know and they booked him on a run around florida um hired me to open a few years in a row wow. uh, on wow. bb's run you know so that's you know, it was a good 10 days of shows of Florida, and that was amazing each time. Mm. Just to be around him, to see how kind he was to everybody, to see 
how serious he took the gigs. Now, back then, yes, he was already quite old, but mm -hmm. not, not like it wasn't the end by any stretch. He was standing up and playing still, and he was, you know, he was still B.B. King. So this would have and, been like the early 90s or something? or Yeah, early 90s. Yeah. It would have been yeah. like 90. 94, 93, 94, 95, something like that, 96 mm -hmm. maybe. And and it was just amazing, you know. He BB had bad diabetes and sometimes he would have low blood sugar and and they'd have to take care of the, get him something quick or whatever. But even when he wasn't feeling well, he'd like he'd be the last guy to leave after the gig after signing every autograph and shaking every hand, you know, for people who were waiting and taking every picture. Um that says something to his, the longevity of his career too, I'm it's, sure. It was it was uh, you know a big influence on, not music at all, but just learning what it takes to be a good person in the music business and uh, how you want to be and uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I was that was really fortunate. And then some nights he would say, "Hey young man, come come on in you know," or "Hey come come in the bus," and. I just talk to him, you know, and sometimes I'd ask questions about specific things. Other times I just listen, you know, while he talked about about things and, you know, and just just getting to be around that I feel like changed me for the the better, you know, whatever it is. It just it was a, a I was lucky to get to do that for a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, I'm real. sure that those times that you got to do that are are just precious. I mean, you can't you can't uh <laughs> you can't buy that kind of stuff you know no no it was yeah. it was really great and um you know i i got lucky like that a lot as a kid as far as getting to play with or be around people who i admired a lot and uh you know some of it was because they they were just interested in the the gimmick of the little kid guitar player which is cool mm -hmm. you know but a it, it enabled me to to get a lot of cool experience and and soak things up because I never taken myself too seriously. All I cared about was getting better as a musician. I just love music so much. So, right. so I took those opportunities more as like, Hey, I'm just going to listen to everything I can. You know, when I, when I used to open for people like that, and even now when I'm on festivals or lineups where there's other bands, I'm the guy, I'm not the guy who, who, you know, doesn't like to be around music and leaves when my show's over. No, I'm the guy who hangs around all day and listens right. to everybody else. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I just want to see what everybody else is doing. I want to hear what I want to, I want to grow. I want to learn because, uh, music is like the best thing ever. Yeah. And it's not even necessarily playing too. It's like, what are the other people doing on stage too? You know, just everything. Yeah. It's all of it, you know, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, to some small degree, like just how kind BB was with me, you know, now I sometimes have people who it's weird, but they'll say they've been listening to me for 10 years and they're fans and maybe <laughs> they're on the bill, right. you know, and that's right. weird to me, but you know, it's little things like that. So I know like, okay, here I'm playing a festival coming up, whatever. There's some people before me on the bill, you know, that have, made it clear to me that I'm an influence of them. They, they let me know. I've maybe known them over the years on the internet or something like that. So I'm going to go early to make sure they see that I'm there to see them play, you know, because it's mm -hmm. the right thing to do sure. uh, and because sure. other people did it for me, you know what right. I mean? And things like that. That's the kind of stuff I was, I learned from those scenarios and those things was the right, just the right way to be, you know? Well, I think, those old school guys like like BB knew what he was doing. He knew that he was passing down certain things to you. What what he he might not know exactly what it was, but he just probably knew that here's this kid and he's really into this. You know that hanging with him was probably a a big thing. So I'm sure cool. uh, he absolutely knew that <laughs> it was important to me. Right, no, no question, because he and, had to, he did it every night of his life, you know. And that's knew. the sweetheart thing about it all, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, who do you think should have got the who should get the real credit for the birth of rock and roll? Chuck Berry or BB? <laughs> uh, the birth of rock and roll? Yeah. Oh man, Little Richard. <laughs> Little Richard. That's Fats Domino. Little Richard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess. Know, the, I, 
I don't, I mean, to me, Little Richard is the king of rock and roll, in uh -huh. my opinion. Okay. You know, um, yeah, Chuck Berry obviously is right, is right there in the, you know, they're all, it's, it's a lot around the same time, you know, yeah. but to me, Little Richard, when you listen to the earliest recordings, to me, that was like the template for what it was about to happen. Um, yeah, Little Richard <laughs> to me. Yeah, cool. Good answer. Good answer. I like it. Whiskey, wine, or beer? Uh, I don't drink, so Coca-Cola. <laughs> cool. Good answer. Yeah. yeah. No no worries. Uh, I don't care either way. <laughs> uh, do you have any uh, favorite musician jokes? <laughs> favorite musician <laughs> jokes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have a few. I'll tell I'll tell my one favorite musician joke. Okay. All right. So, accordion player is at his New Year's <laughs> Eve gig at the okay. Italian restaurant. You know this one? I, I I may know like a a slightly different version, but I it's it sounds like I may know it. Yeah. All right. So the accordion player is at at his New Year's Eve gig at the Italian restaurant. He's you know crushing it, playing all the ballads and all the songs, and the, the audience loves it. All the patrons. And so the owner of the restaurant comes up to him and says, man, that was our best New Year's Eve ever. All the customers loved you. You know, we'd like to make this an annual thing. Uh, so we'll go ahead, if it's okay with you, and book you for next year's New Year's Eve. And the guy, the accordion player says, that's great. I'm so glad you liked it. Can I leave my gear set up? <laughs> yeah. Basically the same thing. But I think the one I, I heard was uh, accordion and a trombone player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that was um, what was Hal Hal Blaine's trombone uh, joke about what do you call a, a trombone player with a beeper? This was back when beepers were a thing and not cell phones. Uh, an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I did hear that one before. Yeah. So, or someone was telling saying that that it was comes from him. Yeah. Yeah. What's a guitar player's favorite vegetable? What? Turnip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. What do you call two guitar players playing the same chart? Ooh, I don't know. Counterpoint. <laughs> Counterpoint. <laughs> yeah. Like they're two playing the they're supposed to be playing the same piece of music, but obviously yeah. it doesn't sound like it. Yeah. yeah. Um how do you tune a Martin? How? C F C F C F. <laughs> That's funny. What's uh What's better than roses on the piano? Don't know this one either. Two lips on the organ. Ah, I do know that. <laughs> I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I used to know a ton of them, but that's uh, that's all I can think of at the moment, anyway. Yeah. So just before we're just gonna wrap up here pretty soon, but uh, what's the best decision you ever made, and what's the worst decision you ever made? It could be just regular life things, or it could be you know, with your career or something or. Yeah, that's, uh, geez. Well, the best decision I ever made was marrying my wife, <laughs> you know, definitely without question. That's my best decision ever. Um, yeah, she seems cool. I just got the vibe just from the emails back and forth is, is like, yeah, she's, she seems she is really cool, cool. And she's cool. definitely responsible for allowing me to arrive at where I'm at now, you know, which is, Maybe finally a self-sustaining uh, <laughs> musician who makes a, a living and all those things. You know, for a long time, she was the rock of our mm. family, enabling me to continue building my career and finding my voice and do the things that, that I do. Um, so definitely that was my best decision. Um, my worst decision is also one of my best decisions. It just depends on how you take it. And that would be the decision to move out here to L.A. Mm -hmm. and kind of change my, uh, you know, trajectory. Uh, right. At the time, I was kind of frustrated with, you know, my progress as a blues guy and front man. And I wanted to figure out how to make a living and be more responsible. I was married and all those things. So we moved out here and I ended up doing much more sessions and touring and, and all those things. So it was a great decision personally for my family and for all those things. Yet, if I maybe would have stayed doing my own thing all the way through it, you know, maybe things would have ended up differently if I would have not given, not necessarily given up, but not stopped right. the way that my friend Joe Bonamassa didn't stop, you know, because for a time we were, 
you know, I would say we were on the same level and we're about the same age and we've known each other our whole lives. Mm -hmm. The biggest difference is he never stopped. He never right. gave up. He just continued getting in that van, playing his things, losing money, and it paid off. You know what right. I mean? And so, but things work out the way they work out. If I would have done that, I wouldn't be the musician I am today because I knew I grow. I've grown as a musician in the last 20 years out here in L.A. in a way I never would have if I had only stayed in the van. And then who, only my own music. Who um, knows? I mean, there's lots of people that stay in the van and maybe still don't get as far as they would have liked. But so you never know. I mean, that too. That's a that hard too. call. So it was like, I always, you know, I wonder about it sometimes. But I, I, I wouldn't be where I am now. I wouldn't be able to produce records and run Pro Tools and Mike draw and, and do all the things I do now if I had only stayed in the van. You know what right. I mean? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, maybe someday <laughs> you'll, I'll, I'll get you to produce uh, my next recording. Nice. Um, I love producing. It's yeah. You know, it was something I didn't think I'd be, uh, you know, ever into, and uh -huh. now it's I absolutely love it. And I mean, it's a good. I mean, it, to some degree, it's about half of my year every year. It keeps growing every year. The amount of records I'm producing and things I'm doing, and I really enjoy doing it. Well, for some reason, I just think that we would make a good match that way just uh who knows but that's my know. thinking yeah um so with all your worst and best decisions do you have any regrets about anything no no actually i, I don't mm -hmm. really you know i just i'm grateful for every day that i get to play guitar and people have any interest in it and that yeah. doesn't necessarily mean money you know it's not monetarily mm -hmm. even though that's important that i'm able to take care of my family and be responsible it's it's just more like i'm just amazed you know even in today's day of social media it's amazing to me that you know like you said if i made a video today and posted it on youtube thousands of people would watch it immediately right. you know that's unreal if I posted a new single today surprise hey instagram here's a new single just came out go buy it here a few thousand people would buy it like quickly mm -hmm. that's unreal to me i'm so yeah. grateful for that and and the you know so i just i just want to keep doing that for the rest of my life like just just playing guitar making music being creative and as long as i can do that i don't regret anything and i'm i'm just happy to continue cool man i that's great that's a uh, i think uh more people need to take the attitude of gratitude <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's amazing. Like, yeah. you know, am I rolling in it? No, but my family's okay. Mm -hmm. I got a house. I got a studio. You got to play music every day of my life. Like, I, you know, is it tough? Absolutely. You know, do I have to bust my ass? Yes. Mm -hmm. But, man, it couldn't be more gratifying that it works out mm -hmm. most, most times, you know. Cool. Yeah, and I'm sure uh, to your, uh, you know, referring to your studio, I'm sure it was like a major headache to build that studio it was a major too. headache a major expense i mean yeah. permitting is no fun first off and no. then yeah it was a major <laughs> expense and i didn't know what would come of it at the time right you know i, it's a I bit wasn't of a really gamble right records at all you know mm -hmm. when i built it it was more going to be a place for me to produce my own records and do continue doing more guitar sessions mm -hmm. you know and things like that and it definitely changed over time as soon as i built it people started wanting to come here and people started asking me to work with them and in, in a different way and yeah it ended up being a godsend having this here build it and they will come sure. <laughs> um can you talk about your flat five lounge yeah so uh you know the flat five lounge is basically just the subscription side of of my youtube um and there's a few tiers to it the, the, the intermediate rulers the beginning rulers and the the fucking rulers and uh, <laughs> you know the, the the top tier we have a discord where we chat in there and people can talk to me and ask me questions i post videos just for the members uh again i've been slacking lately but that was mostly because i was on the road for a lot lately mm -hmm. um but yeah it's basically just uh a hangout for the members of of my youtube channel and um it's kind of cool actually they built this whole little community in the discord and they mostly talk to each other so mm -hmm. i just chime in and you know answer questions and right. it's a nice right. little community and like 
they've been very supportive. A number of them have bought the guitar, this guitar already. Nice. And things like nice. that. Like, it's so cool. Again, all those things are... The fact that anybody has any care about what I do or would care about my... You know, they, they want to know they're going to buy some piece of gear. They want to ask me about it. Or they want to know, hey, Josh, what would you play over this chord? You know, whatever. Like, that's amazing to me that anybody cares about any of that stuff. It, it's kind of humbling, right, when, when that, those kind of things Very happen. Much. I mean, Very especially much. if you're in the right frame of mind. I mean, I guess you could, if you're the right wrong person, you could it could go to your head or something. But No, the fact that yeah. anybody, like I said, has any interest in what I do or so much interest in what I do that they, you know, they want to – ask me questions they trust my advice they trust my opinion those types of things all all amazing nice 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 uh i encourage everyone to check out josh's website josh smith guitar dot com or let me say that again josh smith guitar dot com and if you're a fan of josh's consider joining his flat five lounge yeah. um anything that you want to mention that you'd like people to to check out or know about Nothing new, special, really. I mean, go go check out an Ibanez Flat Five guitar if you if you get a chance. Uh -huh. um, and I, and I have some new music coming soon. Uh, I'm going to release a single in February next month, and pre-orders for, for for an album will, will start then. Uh, it's kind of a surprise album, but uh, <laughs> so I, I I'm not talking about what it is yet, but mm -hmm. it'll start to it'll be be all be revealed soon. Uh, uh, something I'm really proud of. So new music coming soon. Nice. Uh, do you have any courses available or anything like that? or Just the, the True Fire courses, and uh -huh. I have stuff with Jam Tracks as well. Um, there's some new ones with Jam Tracks getting ready to come out. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. Suspects. Well, if you want to send me the links, I'll post them on the video description. Okay, and stuff. will do. Josh, thanks for hanging out, man. You're welcome, man. Thank Ho you for asking. Nice chatting with you. Yeah, hopefully we can talk in person sometime. Anytime, man. I was I was hoping to be in LA at at the uh, the Nam show, but it's not <laughs> happening. <laughs> yeah, it may yeah. not happen again. Who knows? Who knows? I I really don't have a good feel for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I just it's I mean like most people, it's just a good way to get your um, nerves on edge, uh, listening to all the loud noises, but meeting people at least anyway. <laughs> Right. I'm a nerd, so I, yeah. I still love the NAMM show. I yeah. soak up every minute of it. I love looking at gear. I love walking around. I love bumping into my friends that I only see at the NAMM show every year. So I've missed it the last few years. Well, I'll let you go. I don't want to take up any more of your time. But, uh, man, it'd be awesome if we keep in touch somehow. And Yeah. And uh, like I said, I'd, I'd love someday for you to possibly do some producing. I, I Man, I'm, I'm honored. So hit me up. Awesome. All right. Well, have a good night. Great talking to you. Take care, man. Have a good night, man. Bye.